time, basically like a checkbook. Um, and uh, I think that would be uh, really the full disclosure that everybody wants um, in elections. So we're also still, still on that one. Um, one of the other ones, of course, that uh, we're dealing with is uh, my 16-year-old. Um, they all come in to see me when they want the driver's license. Uh, they don't all come in to see me when they decide it's, uh, you know, when we tell them it's time to vote at 18. Uh, so I think a good way to get them into the system would be to pre-register them at 16 and activate that when they turn 18. Um, when they come in at 16, they have their parent with them, they have their paperwork, we know who they are, we can get them into the system, and I think that would also help with the issue that we talked about before, which is when they get to college not being able to vote absentee, because this will be in-person vote, in-person registration. Um, so that will help eliminate that issue, definitely, um, for them when they get to college. Um, and then, of course, the inactive voter file, um, we need to have that in order to make sure um, that we have um, the opportunity to make sure our lists are accurate. And uh, that is something that's also part of HAVA, the Help America Vote Act. Um, and we need to have that in Michigan, so we need to have it in active voter file. Um, of course, you know I support uh, early in-person voting, and where you have the opportunity to vote at your local clerk's office uh, to seven days before the election. Um, other states that have done this have had a, um, uh, have had um, really great success with this, and they found that they've had actually 50% of the folks vote before election day. Uh, with early voting. And that really makes it uh, a lot easier for the voter. They don't have to worry about precinct lines. They can just go to their city or county clerk's office and get the ballot that fits them and get that vote counted. And they get that opportunity to have second chance voting. And that really will help um, with a lot of those folks that vote absentee. Because as you know, especially in the primaries, if they cross over, unfortunately that ballot cannot be counted because of the fact that um, it's validated by voting in both primaries. So, what we want to make sure is that their vote is counted. If we have this early in-person voting, they can bring it right to the clerk's office, run it through the machine, and if, it, for example, they did cross over, they get that second chance and that opportunity to vote again. Um, we also want to look at the initiative reform process. Um, as you know, that's been a big subject lately, so we really would like to still keep that on the front burner. Um, we also want to look at electronic poll books. Um, and super precincts to go along with early voting. Um, electronic poll book is really going to make life simpler for a lot of folks. Uh, we do have uh, some resources left from HAVA, the Health America Vote Act, um, that we can use uh, to do some testing with this, and we're going to try to do that in the next year. Um, and I think this is really the future and the way to go. Um, you're going to have much better records. Um, the clerks are going to be able to close the polls earlier at night. If any of you worked in a polling place, you know how there's the poll book and all the other books that they have to sign and check. An electronic poll book, you eliminate a lot of that, and it would be a lot simpler to, to close the polls in the evening. And it will be a lot simpler for the voter, too, because they'd literally be able to swipe their driver's license or ID card. Their name would come up in the poll book, they would check it, they'd issue the ballot, and um, it would just make for a very clean and efficient system. A lot of states have been uh, trying it out and with uh, good results, so we're looking forward to trying trying that. The other thing that's been a big issue lately that's come up is uh, random audits, election audits. Um, we'd like to have the authority to do that after the election. Um, that's been an issue I know that a lot of people are concerned about in other states. Um, it's also come up here too. And on that note, um, I would like to let you know the whole bill, which is in um, Congress, um, deals with some of these issues. Um, we are uh, working with them in Congress right now because uh, after HAVA, um, they really decided that Congress wants to get involved in states. Um, and so I would encourage any of you now to start talking to your Congress folks about this because this is something new. Um, some of us have been in election business a long time. We've never really had the federal government involved in administrating elections in the states. It's really fallen upon the states to do that. But that's become more of a reality now, I think, after the Florida election. And so it's something we need to be concerned about and talking to our congressional folks about. But we need to work together on this. Um, and I appreciate you know, everything that you guys have done. Um, I look forward to working with you on this. And I just want to again thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to you today. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming and scheduling a little later date than when we were scheduled today. Um, I wanted to go back to, I think, your number two item, petition reform issue. Um, 
you know, that I have been along with my house counterpart and a variety of other people, Senator Jacobs office has been there working on this whole uh, petition initiative revamp for reform. Um, what what is the importance of doing that um, right now and you know you know if you could help with maybe some of the other meeting members that haven't been so intimately involved with their 7 30 a.m. meetings um, <laughs> to understand you know why this is important to do and uh, uh, why change now? You mentioned a few things. Well, last um, election, the major election we had, we really saw that there's a lot more activity from other groups other than the two political parties now involved, especially in presidential elections. And I think now that they've had some success in presidential elections, I think they're willing to move down to congressional and House and Senate elections. And what's happened is you have more people involved in the process, which is not bad. We're all for that. But you've got groups that we don't usually work with um, on a daily basis. And again, they come in and out of town. We don't have somebody that we can talk to about it. And unfortunately, the voters are the ones that are getting disenfranchised because if, for example, they don't get them into us on time after they've collected the signatures, that's a problem. Um, if, they're in the, you know, if they're collecting signatures that aren't of real people, that's a problem. It takes up time for our local clerks to check that. There's just a lot of issues that really came up um, that we had never encountered before. Um, both the political parties had, you know, pretty much followed the rules of the game here, and, but these outside groups really haven't. I think what I'm going to do is turn it over to Chris a minute to talk about what the committee finally agreed on. Uh, I think to your question, if I could add to that, um, Madam Chair, is the last year, um, particularly with the Save Our State uh, petition, uh, it was clear that there were a large number of fraudulent signatures duplicate signatures, the same person signing as many as 17 times. Uh, and that really gave pause. We've seen that in the past, uh, but it, it really came to the fore uh, in 2006. And what that gave pause to is a lot of different interests in this process going, you know, we ought to take a global look at how we do this business rather than piecemeal just uh, correcting this or that. Clearly, the payment by signature is the issue that creates uh, fraudulent signatures. Uh, it's two to three dollars, sometimes up to five dollars a signature, uh, and we've seen that over the years, and the state has a history of documenting that kind of activity. But more importantly, uh, groups looked at it and said, well, we need an opportunity to challenge these signatures, to really do the work that's necessary to determine whether a petition is sufficient or not. Uh, when we only have a 60-day period from the time it's filed to the time it's got to be uh, certified by the Board of State Canvassers, there's not a whole lot of time in there for groups to do challenges. We essentially give them 10 business days and literally to go in and find duplicate signatures, that's, that's a real tight time turnaround. So we've seen that. We've also seen the need to have more information uh, either on the petition itself that uh, gives the voters an indication of what's going on, uh, fiscal impact statements, for example, what is the effect of this taxing issue or that taxing issue, uh, any number of issues that this committee uh, at 7.30 in the morning have right for on. Months. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for months. For months, yes. This uh, goes on and on and on. And uh, I, I thought we'd come up with a very good list of actually moving the filing deadline back. Uh, creating a longer time for challenges so the petitions could be inspected, uh, making it clear that fraudulent uh, or misrepresentation and 